Hello and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Kat Zakreski, a national tech policy reporter here at the Washington Post. And my guest today is Representative Jay Olbernolte, a congressman from California. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us today at Post Live. Hello, Kat, how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I want to dive right into the news, which is, of course, that the European Union reached a deal on its Artificial Intelligence Act over the weekend. Do you think that this legislation will influence attempts in Congress to regulate artificial intelligence? I'm sure it will, uh, both in positive ways and in negative ways. Uh, the EU has been working on this piece of legislation for over two years now. And it's interesting to see the kind of tumultuous negotiations that have taken place because a lot has changed in the world of technology in the last two years. Two years ago was before the introduction of chat GPT, it was before generative AI uh, was introduced. So the legislation has actually changed a lot in the last two years. And uh, unfortunately, I think the regulatory landscape is going to have to change even further in the future uh, as the technology continues to evolve. And you bring up a really interesting challenge here, which is that the technology is moving so quickly. This EU AI Act, even once it passes the European Parliament, will take another two years to fully take effect. What do you think some of the negative implications will be um, for this legislation and its impact on Congress's approach that you just mentioned? Well, I mean, I think Europe has been rightfully criticized in the past for adopting regulatory frameworks that favor regulation over innovation. So uh, you've seen a diminishment of the investment in cutting edge technology development in Europe as a result of some of the actions that they've taken. We wanna make sure that that does not happen in the United States. I believe that it's possible to foster an atmosphere that welcomes innovation, that embraces the United States' role as the crucible for entrepreneurialism and the development of new technologies while still protecting the rights and freedoms of Americans. And I think we can mitigate against the harms uh, that AI could potentially introduce while still fostering uh, an atmosphere of innovation here in the US. But I wanted to ask you, if Europe is moving so much more quickly on regulation, do you think that there is a chance that Europe becomes the de facto global standard in the absence of action from the US Congress? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I, certainly the international community is not treating it that way. Uh, I think there are a couple of different regulatory models. The EU has embraced a very centralized model, which is kind of uh, their habit. Uh, they envision a brand new bureaucracy and a licensing authority for really uh, all uses of AI outside of a low risk context. Uh, but if you want to see another leader in the AI space, look at the United Kingdom, which has embraced uh, pretty much the opposite philosophy. Uh, they're in favor of empowering their existing, existing sectoral regulators and equipping them with the tools that they need to regulate AI within their sectoral spaces. And uh, I actually think that that makes a lot more sense. Uh, our sectoral regulators here in the United States are already having to grapple with the problems that AI brings in uh, in our commercial landscape. Uh, if you uh, look, for example, at the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, uh, the FDA testified in a health subcommittee hearing a couple of weeks ago that they have already processed over 500 applications for the use of AI and medical devices. That's a stunning figure if you think about it, over 500 applications already. Uh, so we have to ask ourselves, is it easier to teach an agency like the FDA what it doesn't already know about artificial intelligence? Or is it easier to teach a brand new bureaucracy like the one that the EU is spinning up everything that the FDA already knows about ensuring patient safety and medical devices? That's a pretty thought provoking question. At a time when there's intense debate over government spending, do the resources, do the agencies have the resources and people they need to address this AI challenge at the current moment? Well, I think the answer is uh, certainly not right now. They're going to need uh, not just money, but they're going to need manpower. And the manpower component is, is actually, I think, the more important one. Uh, right now, there is a dearth of uh, of artificial intelligence experience in the federal workforce. And so we, uh, both at the Energy and Commerce Committee and in the Science, Space and Technology Committee, are trying to catalyze the introduction of more technical talent into federal government. Uh, and that's not just to enable these agencies to regulate, 
It's also to be able to enjoy the gains in productivity that AI will bring to improving the efficiency of these federal agencies. And I think that that's uh, an equally important thing to be focused on. We know that the private sector is spending so much money for AI talent at this moment. What steps can federal agencies take to become more attractive workplaces for people who have experience in AI? Well, I think it starts with uh, expanding awareness of the need to fill these pools of talent. Uh, I had a bill last year that uh, was signed into law creating a new uh, federal workforce classification for computer science professionals. So that's just you know one of those baby steps. Uh, but I also think it's important to uh, to open people's eyes to the fact that uh, there is a career path for AI professionals in uh, in federal government and uh, and also in the, uh, the the White House and the executive branch. Uh, you know that that hasn't been a traditional career path for AI professionals. But I wish more early career AI uh, academics would think about that when they're making their career decisions. And Congressman, I want to shift now to the current debate in Congress over AI legislation and the work that Senator Schumer has been doing with the bipartisan AI forums. Do you think that these forums have been a productive way to approach the challenges and benefits of AI? Oh, I absolutely do. I mean, productive in the sense where that we're this is uh, early days for crafting a unified federal regulatory landscape for artificial intelligence. Uh, but the first step has got to be in educating uh, our colleagues, both in the House and the Senate, uh, as to what artificial intelligence is, uh, what it is not, what the risks are, what the risks are not, and uh, that will then inform what our approach to regulation needs to be. And uh, the Senate has been focused through these AI forums in achieving that education, and I think that uh, they've been very effective. And we're about a year out from the release of ChatGPT, which really brought this AI debate to the fore in Congress. I mean, how would you describe the level of understanding that most of your colleagues have at this point about what AI does and doesn't do? Well, certainly much better than it was a year ago. Uh, a year ago, we were having discussions uh, about the fact that the, the chief hazard of AI is not going to be an army of evil robots with red laser eyes rising up to take over the world out of the Terminator. Uh, you know, AI has a lot of potentially very serious hazards, uh, things related to privacy and the spread of mis and disinformation and uh, exacerbating human biases and all kinds of things like that. Uh, very serious, but you know, not not an army of evil robots. We're we're way beyond that now. I think that my colleagues in general have a pretty good understanding of, of what we mean when we say artificial intelligence and about the risks that uh, we need to mitigate. Here in the House, we have had a House task force on artificial intelligence that has existed the last eight months. And uh, we've been meeting regularly, trying to educate people uh, on, on uh, this effort that we're undertaking. And I, I think it's been very successful. So we're way beyond evil robots, but how far do you think we are from the US Congress actually passing comprehensive legislation addressing AI? Well, I mean, I think it's important to talk about what we mean when we say comprehensive legislation, because uh, I think if you look at the trials and tribulations that the European Union has just gone through to pass the bill that they have finally agreed to, uh, and if you look at what it does do and what it doesn't do and the, the amount of changes that are undoubtedly going to need to be made to it uh, in the future, I think you reach the inescapable conclusion that incrementalism might be a more appropriate goal. So uh, there are we have to ask ourselves as regulators why we seek to regulate. In the, in the case of artificial intelligence, it's pretty clear the reason to regulate is to avoid the potential hazards of AI. So you have to understand when you craft a regulatory framework what those hazards are to be able to craft a framework that protects against them. And I think that there are some short-term hazards that we need to mitigate right now. So that'll be uh, that'll catalyze the need to act on those issues within the next hopefully six months. Uh, but then there are longer term hazards that are a little blurrier and we have more runway on those because they're they're medium term and long term hazards. And so we can take our time on those and understand the hazard better to make sure we craft an appropriate regulatory solution. And I think that's healthy. So I think what you'll see out of Congress is probably not one big bill like the European Union. I think you'll see a few bills a year for the next 10 years. And uh, that's not a bad thing. And you mentioned there are hazards that the U.S. Congress needs to address perhaps in the next six months. What are some of those hazards? 
Well, well the short-term hazards, uh, one is the way that artificial intelligence can be maliciously used to pierce through personal digital data privacy and to re-aggregate data that has been supposedly disaggregated. Uh, AI is really good at doing that. And if, if you have the ability to create a digital data profile on people, then you also have the ability to, to build behavioral models about what those people will do and seek to influence their behavior. So uh, that's something that AI can be used for now. Uh, and for that reason, I think that one of the first things that Congress needs to do is to finish the work of creating a federal digital data privacy standard. Right now, that's something that we have let the states regulate on. I think that's been very unhealthy. We've got currently 23 different state regulations on digital data privacy. Soon there will be 50. Uh, it's very destructive to entrepreneurialism, and uh, there's there's really no unified standard amongst those. So uh, this is something that I think Congress needs to do. And you know, speaking of the states, I think another thing Congress needs to do very soon is to make it clear what the rules of the road are and where the guardrails are on on regulation. In uh, other words, what what is going to be uh, preempted at the federal level. Uh, as uh, the regulation of interstate commerce is, you know, as the Constitution makes clear is appropriate. And what are we going to allow the states to regulate on? Because there are many states, including my home state of California, that uh, are being very aggressive in introducing AI legislation on a wide variety of different topics. So that's something that I think Congress needs to do uh, to do in the short term. One of the arguments for state regulation is that these states can serve as, quote, the laboratories of democracy. And when you have new technologies, you can try them on a smaller scale in in um, California and other states. What's your response to advocates who say states need to be able to set these tough standards and baselines? Oh, I, I think that that's uh, an important role for the states, and the states have played that admirably well. Uh, however, it's also important to to realize that the federal that our constitution and the concept of federalism uh, s makes it clear that when it comes to interstate commerce. The federal government is the one that should be doing the regulating, uh, and that's something that uh, completely completely makes sense in the context of uh, of technology and its application. Uh, if you have 50 different state regulations on something like AI, for example, think about how hard it would be for two guys in a garage to start the next Apple or HP or Facebook. Uh, almost impossible because the only companies that have the sophistication to deal with a regulatory landscape that complicated are big established companies with office, office buildings full of lawyers, not two guys uh, trying to start a new company. So, uh, you know, th this is why it's important for, uh, for the federal government to establish one set of general rules for the road when it comes to interstate commerce in AI uh, and uh, to make it clear to everybody what those rules are. And Congressman, we're just about out of time, but I wanted to make sure I got a chance to ask you about the recent drama at OpenAI. We saw the ouster and quick return of Sam Altman as CEO. Does that instability concern you at all? And do you think it changes OpenAI's position in Washington? Well, you know, I think that it's less an indication of anything that's AI related and more an indication of an innovative business model that was attempted and that perhaps had some pitfalls that were unanticipated. So uh, OpenAI, as you're aware, has a really interesting structure where it's a for-profit corporation uh, that is uh, has as its, its parent a non-profit corporation with its own board. So the, the, the aims and the rights that those boards of directors are protecting are different. Uh, in those two cases, and I, what you, what I, I think you saw happen, happen with OpenAI was an illustration of uh, those conflicts. So I hope that they uh, figured out. I like Sam. Uh, I think OpenAI is doing some great work. I'm sure that they're going to continue to be uh, an inf influential player in AI. But I also hope that we, as a society, figure out how to navigate this space between profits and nonprofits, because I do believe it's possible to have a profit incentive, but also be interested in furthering the goals of society. So that's important to get that model right. Well, Congressman, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today at Post Live. And please don't go anywhere. I'll be back with my next guest in just a few minutes.
Research America, and I'm a co-chair of the Science and Technology Action Committee, or STAC. Today, we're here to discuss our new report, The State of Science in America, the first of its kind. It draws on expert opinion as well as findings from a survey of working Americans in five sectors to formulate recommendations that we're offering to policymakers to assure that this nation remains prosperous, secure, and globally competitive. Specifically, we recommend that policymakers work with the science and, and technology community to direct and fund a national science and technology strategy that will enable us to address the existential threats of our time, from health challenges to water scarcity, food insecurity, and energy transformation. Many Americans we surveyed believe that the U.S. is losing or has already lost its status as the global science and technology leader. 60% believe that China will claim that mantle within the next five years. The report makes it clear that Americans across all sectors and political ideologies understand that falling behind on science and technology investment threatens our future. And science experts agree. So what are we going to do about it? Joining me to answer that question are two of my fellow STAC co-chairs, Bill Novelli of Georgetown University and Keith Yamamoto of UCSF. Keith, let me start with you. Why should we be concerned about whether we are leading the world in science and technology? You know, Mary, sitting atop the world rankings in science and technology, is not a silly or trivial goal. There's two reasons. First, federal investment in science and technology is a major driver in improving our lives, our health, our general well being, quality of life. Also important, but less obvious, those investments in so doing generate strong economic and job growth and bolster national security. Second, whoever leads the world in science and technology has the biggest influence on setting the goals and values and standards that determine what and how newly discovered knowledge will be developed into technologies and products that affect people's lives. And that country will also have a head start in getting those developments and technologies underway. So when the United States leads the way, everyone benefits because we believe that our priorities and standards and values will improve all lives. So what is it that will prevent us from claiming that leadership? First, federal support for science and technology is only 0.7% of the US gross domestic product. You know, that's less than half of what it was at its peak in 1964, it's a long time ago. Second, we lack a unified national strategy that inhibits our focus. In the meantime, our rivals are copying our past successes that propelled our society and are increasing their investment in science and technology intent on overtaking the United States by the end of the decade. Well, thank you, Keith. I know these are worries that are shared by many in the science community, but it's also shared as we've learned in this survey by those who rely on science and technology all the time. In other words, everybody, all of us. Now, one of the other findings from the report that sticks with me is that more than 70% of those we surveyed said they believe children will be worse off in the future than in private previous generations. Should we be discouraged, Bill, by this data point? I was concerned about that as well, Mary. Americans today are rightfully concerned about our next generation in a world where the United States lead on innovation is declining. I was also concerned about the finding that when asked to rate the quality of science and technology resources in seven areas, 69% rated K through 12 STEM education as fair or poor. That was the lowest score. In addition, we need a diverse STEM workforce for tomorrow's jobs. And those who think children will be better off in the future, about 15%, mostly credited future advances in science and technology. These findings show the absolute importance and urgency 
of increased federal investment. And that's why the top recommendation we're making in this report is for policymakers to work with the science and technology community to direct and fund a national strategy. The lack of a national strategy and lack of a federal agency coordination plan, along with uneven, short-sighted funding, are serious shortcomings that we can no longer ignore. This report is a wake-up call for policymakers. All the warning lights are flashing red. Policymakers ought to be encouraged by the strong support in this report for investment that will strengthen the state of science in America for decades to come. So this is where we need to go. And now we need the courage and the political will to act. Well, that is really well said, Bill. Um, but let's turn to just a few specifics. Keith, can you say just a little more about what we're calling on policymakers to do? First, continued support for basic discovery research with the, now with a follow-on effort to leverage those discoveries into technologies that address societal challenges. Second, Bill said it, coordination. Coordinate the talents and technologies across the two dozen federal agencies that advance science and technology programs. Only collaboration across those silo walls will bring success with these societal challenges. And third, build and support a diverse workforce to help formulate and then execute on the plan. So enable all of this by at least doubling federal funding for science and technology in the next five years, and we'll be on the right path. Well, thank you both, Keith and Bill. Our time, unfortunately, is up today. To our viewers, if you'd like to learn more about the State of Science Report or be in touch with us, please visit sciencetechaction.org. That's sciencetechaction.org. Thanks so much. If you're around a three-year-old, all they do is ask why, 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 mm -hmm. which is exactly what a scientist does. So really the role of science educators is to keep that passion in students and to help them focus it so that they can grow up and someday really explore the world and learn something new for all of us. People come to us, outside partners come to us initially because they're interested in our graduates. And then they learn that DSU doesn't just have one program in cybersecurity, we have six. We have six programs related in computer science and artificial intelligence. And then on top of that, we now have engaged in pretty robust um, research activity, applied research that cuts across the university, across every Welcome back to Washington Post Live. For those of you just joining us, my name is Kat Zakreski, and I'm a national tech policy reporter here at the Washington Post. I'm joined now by two guests, Jose Marie Griffiths, president of Dakota State University, and Erica Shugart, 
Executive Director for the National Science Teaching Association. Dr. Griffiths, Dr. Shugart, thank you so much for joining us today at Post Live. Thanks, Kat. Great to be here. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And, you know, there was an international exam released just last week that showed that math performance of American teenagers has declined since 2017. Scores are lower than 20 years ago, putting U.S. teens behind global competitors. Dr. Shugart, why do you think this downward trend is happening? Sure. So we definitely have seen a downward trend in a lot of the test scores since COVID, particularly in mathematics. Uh, fortunately, we were able to keep the scores high when it came to English language arts, probably because parents were reading to their kids when they were home. But in math, we have seen scores go down. So I think the report you're referring to is the PISA report, which really looks at math in a practical setting, which isn't how we teach math in the U.S. Um, in a lot of ways, which is why I think that it's incredibly important for us to spend more time in the school day around places where math intersects with other areas like science, engineering, and tech that really give that meaningful connection for students when they come in. And Dr. Griffiths, I wanna ask you, what risk does this present at the collegiate level where you're seeing these students? Well, uh, the, the risk is that students are not prepared with sufficient math skills so that that limits the capabilities going into STEM fields. Um, we really would like to see more people um, engaging in math and hopefully eventually more math teachers in the K through 12 system. I, I think there's a there's a shortage there and a problem. So young people are not necessarily getting the right level of, of math capability that they need to take them forward in various uh, STEM disciplines. And Dr. Griffiths, I wanted to ask you a bit more because Dr. Shugart just mentioned the impact of the pandemic. What impact are you seeing from the pandemic on students entering college, especially when it comes to pursuing STEM degrees? Well, we are a STEM focused institution, so we, of course, are getting students who have a predisposition towards STEM degrees. But we did notice that, um, that for two years after the pandemic, we, we saw um, a, a noticeable change in young people coming into the university sector. Um, they were less social. They were more cautious about interacting with others. They were quieter. Um, this year, for the first time, the incoming uh, first year students this year were much more engaged and much more social than those over the last two years. And it was quite noticeable, not just by educators, but by everybody who interacted with our students on campus. And Dr. Shugart, I want to ask you about the increased funding going into STEM education in recent years. Um, this data suggests that those investments are not improving the landscape among young people. How should those dollars be invested in order to maximize STEM education among K through 12 students? Well, first, I would push back a little bit on your conclusion about whether that those funds have been valuable, because we do have this major issue of COVID and the changes that occurred there. And I think that the extra funds that have been going into education have been absolutely essential for the recovery we have had. We don't really know. We haven't played out the role where we didn't have those funds, right? So um, I, I do think that the increased investment is incredibly important. Additionally, what I would say is in the sciences, we know a lot um, of evidence-based approaches of how to improve education. It's uh, called the Framework for Science Education. And for the first time this year, 48 states have put those into their state standards. Uh, education is a, is a real local affair here in the United States. So this is the chance now to be able to leverage this evidence-based approach in order to improve education. And it's not a time to say, let's not put the resources in, but it's a time for us to think about how we can really um, even synergize and increase more what we've been doing. Because as um, Leslie Cornfield, who is the CEO of the National Education Equity Lab said, talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. And we want to make sure that opportunity is given to all students by providing the funding that schools need. And Dr. Shugart, we just had a conversation before this about AI policy. And in light of what we're seeing with generative AI, especially the ability, for instance, of some of these systems to develop code, I wanted to ask you, how do you think education needs to change at the K through 12 level? And do we need to rethink how we're funding some of these priorities in light of these advancements? 
So a lot of states, you know, if we, we talk about STEM. Lots of times people say STEM uh, as it's as if it's one thing. Of course, we have science, technology, and engineering, and math. And each one of those is often taught kind of separately in our schools. Um, definitely recommend thinking about an integrated approach. But I think that AI is a huge opportunity. Lots of times it's brought up in the schools as will this be an issue or a problem. But I see it being used by teachers in incredibly innovative ways already. They're using it to help improve their lessons, help with brainstorming. They're using it with students not to try to limit it, but to have the students really use critical thinking skills where they're um, working with the AI to evaluate the data that's being included, the kind of conclusions that the AI is coming to. So I actually think it's quite an opportunity to be brought in. And I don't know that we need to change things, but it's a way to kind of expand what is already being done and challenge where we go from things maybe just being rote memorization to being really critical thinking, decision making, which is what we need uh, for our population in the future. Dr. Griffiths, we're about a year out from the initial release of ChatGPT. How have you seen um, this? technology change the curriculum at your school? Well, it's uh, that's interesting. As, as I say, as a STEM-oriented school, we've been looking at large language models for quite some time in our computer and cyber sciences department. But now we find that um, faculty and teachers across the curricula are actually engaged in looking at how they can be how they can use AI effectively. It was never a question that we would ban AI. The idea was, are we using it in the way that leverages the best learning opportunity for our students? So an interesting thing happened. Um, in addition to the fact that we have a school of computers, computer and cyber sciences, the faculty across the institution have been holding regular sessions to share experiences and understanding of different ways to incorporate chat DTPT and other AI uh, applications into their coursework and into their uh, daily workloads. So uh, we're seeing some interesting things emerge. And not only that, they then decided they've, they've gone out and paired up and they've gone around uh, uh, the school districts throughout the state to talk about the potential that AI holds so that they demystify it a little bit for people so that it makes it easier to access. And you mentioned that some interesting applications came out of those sessions. Can you tell us um, what some examples are? Oh, gosh. Um, yes. Instead of having uh, students just use um, chat GPT to prepare material, um, ask them questions about how to how to uh, make an arrangement of something, how to create a, 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 an, an address identifying problems and opportunities in a particular area, and then go to ChatGPT and see what ChatGPT comes up with, and then do the compare and contrast so that they're, they're thinking, they're not, not uh, so abdicating their own ability to think to the AI, but using the AI to augment and fine tune some of the thinking they might have produced themselves. And Dr. Sugar, can you walk us through some of the ways that ChatGPT or similar models could be could be worked in at the K through 12 level? Certainly. Well, I love Dr. Griffith's example because I think that sometimes we, I don't know, sometimes when people think about where innovation is happening, they they imagine maybe it's somebody in a lab coat somewhere or, you know, someone off uh, the, the hacker in the back room. But really there's so much innovation going on in education. And I'm just so pleased with how teachers are approaching things. We're seeing a lot of the same kinds of things that Dr. Griffiths was mentioning, which is leveraging AI for higher order thinking. So it's not just, you know, trying to avoid it or ban it, but have students, you know, go in and use chat GPT to generate different approaches and different arguments and then do comparisons um, to use it to help them with brainstorming initial problem sets. I think all of these are kind of really innovative things. They can be done just like at the undergraduate level. It can be done by high schoolers and middle schoolers just with different facilitation by the, the teachers. But obviously, we know that there is a tendency for these systems to get things wrong. It's well documented how chat GPT can hallucinate. Dr. Sugar, uh, what advice do you give to teachers uh, thinking about the limitations of this technology and some of the risks with having particularly children use this in the classroom? Right. I mean, certainly, I think that there's a lot still being figured out about some of these details. But I think when you have an educator who is really thinking about having their students apply critical thinking skills, it's actually some of those kinds of gaps where maybe the, the machine has made something up 
that is that opportunity for the students to identify that, to figure out what is the fact base behind that, to do the analysis. So in some ways, it's kind of some of those gaps where the opportunity lies for educators to explore. And Dr. Griffiths, in our last session, we heard a little bit from Cong Congressman Olbernolte about the talent challenges in the federal government, especially if you're looking at having federal agencies address these problems related to AI more and more. Um, as Congress is debating what to do about AI, what advice do you have for them to, you know, create more pathways from student like your students like yours into the federal government? Thank you. There are a lot of different opportunities. Um, there are there are ways, for example, to accelerate the talent pipeline from high school into college. Uh, we have a cyber academy that's offered across the uh, state online for juniors and seniors in high school to get dual credit programs. We're also looking at the talent that perhaps already exists in the workforce and looking at opportunities for people to reskill and upskill with sort of micro credentials that could be stackable eventually into, into degree programs, but to give people opportunity to catch up in various areas. Uh, the other problem is uh, that, you know, the academia and federal government sort of share um, a challenge, which is both of us um, find that the private sector tends to scoop up as many people as they can who are qualified. Uh, we do have a challenge in the number of qualified faculty to teach at the university level in these fields, in computer science, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, quantum areas. That, that's a big challenge for us. And so we as institutions are also going to have to look at the experts in the field to see how we can involve experts more into our curricula so that the learning becomes uh, much more of a, of a cross-sectorial kind of activity. And you just mentioned upskilling. Could you tell us a little bit more about what you mean for that and what the implications are, particularly for students who might not be traditional college aged? Yes, uh, this would be for people who are already in the workplace who perhaps have had a career in information systems or working with technology, but they don't know about artificial intelligence, they don't know about cybersecurity, they don't know about quantum computing. And so we would be able to give them additional skill, knowledge and skills through, I would say, sort of short uh, bursts of educational opportunities that they could take um, in situ in the workplace that would qualify them for different jobs and better jobs. Some of them will want to actually make a move career-wise from one organization to another, but very often we see institutions and organizations and federal agencies saying, we'd like to have a number of our people uh, uh, learn these things, learn, learn these skills, learn about what the capabilities and limitations are so that they can be more effective in our workplace. If you think about artificial intelligence, uh, since we're on that topic, it, it applies to just about every area of endeavor. And so there's an opportunity Opportunity for a lot of people to gain additional skill and then develop their careers going forward in the way that we heard um, the representative talk about the opportunities that now exist for AI related careers in the federal government, for example. And on that point, you've talked about the tremendously high job placement rate at your school, currently 99.7% overall. Um, what does that say about STEM careers and what do you think other schools can learn from that rate? Um, well, the, the, we've worked very hard to get that rate. As I said, we're focused. So everybody goes out with a degree in something that has a strong uh, education strong uh, computing or technology basis. So if you're a, a, a teacher, you're a qualified teacher now, you know about educational technologies and how to apply them. If you're um, a scientist, you know about the latest technologies that will allow you to do modeling and simulation, etc. cetera. Um, so that really helps, but we also, uh, work very hard from uh, the days the students come into the campus. We don't wait till their last year to say, now we should start thinking about where you might go and work. And we encourage people to take uh, internships, which are great learning experiences for our students. Um, a lot of them are very, do, the, do that in the summer. So a lot of practical experience is, is, is an opportunity for students. We also um, have things like uh, undergraduate research opportunities, which enrich their capability of not only responding to problems and conducting research in an analytical way, but also how do you frame the next question after you've conducted your research? Sort of developing the next question is a difficult skill, but we're able to teach that through practical experience in the research labs alongside our faculty. And Dr. Trigar, I wanna make sure we have some time to talk about diversity in STEM because you've written about how this is 
such an important factor in early education. Can you lay out that case for us here and talk about why that might be even more important given some of the technological transformations we're seeing right now? Yeah, absolutely. I love Dr. Griffiths talking about the program that they have for high schoolers to help them get into the university and to be really prepared to go on to her school. But the truth of the matter is that we need to start back in early childhood education in the K through 12 space. I imagine a lot of parents out there would be really surprised at how little science their elementary school age children get in the classrooms. NSTA recommends that students get an hour a day the average in the US is 20 minutes a day. So lots of kids aren't even getting aren't even getting that. And of course, that's when kids have that natural curiosity. Um, then going into middle school, we know that those are really critical years for keeping young girls in the STEM pipeline. I myself have a daughter who is uh, early in, in high school, very interested in STEM. I'm a scientist by training, and I've had to do a lot to bolster her confidence and make her feel like she could stay in that area. There's just a lot of factors they work against young girls. So what we want to make sure that we're doing is setting up the conditions to allow all young people to realize that they can thrive and flourish in the STEM area. Historically, lots of times classes in this area were really kind of designed to weed out students, um, and, you know, to, to limit students. Um, they were designed to just find the ones that were really the top at that time. And what we know is that there's a tremendous capacity in all students to do science. They just don't have that opportunity. What we see in many classes, um, particularly in areas where students are majority minority, um, that they don't even offer classes. If you look at schools that have over 80% um, children of color, uh, only 40% of them offer a physics class in high school. Only 80% offer biology classes. These are basic classes that students need if they're gonna go on to the undergraduate. So one, we need to make sure that we're teaching in the modality that allows all, teacher, all students to um, come into the classroom, starting with the phenomenon, starting with the student questions, and then letting them connect it to the science ideas. And then making sure that we're actually offering the courses that students need in order to go on and become an undergraduate STEM major. And we have just about a minute left. So Dr. Griffiths, I wanted to turn it back to you because there is this bigger national conversation going on about free speech on college campuses in light of the University of Pennsylvania president's resignation. I just wanted to ask you as a university president, how are you navigating this moment and how are you seeing these issues manifest on your own campus? Thank you. We, uh, we well, it's, it's an important topic and I think that we need our students to understand that we really want, we can we can accept disagreement. What we don't want is, is a lot of uh, physical or, or inappropriate uh, conflict between people. So typically when there are dis different factions at the university, we will bring a group together to say, let's have some conversation about what's going on. Um, we are in the middle of the country, we're perhaps a little, little more immune to some of this, although we do have quite a diversity of population now in uh, South Dakota. But uh, universities are places where we're supposed to be exploring ideas and learning about other, other opinions and other voices. What we can do in that process is find our own voice, but violence is never acceptable. Um, and so we try and sort of ensure that uh, uh, violence is not, I mean, and, and rhetoric is violence. Violence as rhetoric is also um, something that we really shouldn't condone. So we try to get to these issues before they get to a critical point. Try to get the conversations going on early between what's happening with the people who have different belief systems, who come from different cultures, so that we can actually truly get a better understanding of what they do. We don't all have to be convinced that that's absolutely the way we should all be, but we can at least acknowledge the fact that we understand why there might be a difference of opinion or, or a difference of emotional reaction to certain things. Certainly a critical issue now that we're seeing play out throughout the country. We're unfortunately out of time now, so we'll have to leave it there. Thank you both so much for joining me here today at Post Live. It was wonderful to have you both, Dr. Griffiths and Dr. Shugart. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you. And thank all of you for joining us today at Post Live. If you want to find out more information about our upcoming programs, please go to washpostlive.com for more information. I'm Kat Zakreski. Thanks so much.